Hello everyone, and welcome to Slice Print Roleplay. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to find the perfect resin exposure on your resin 3D printer using UV tools. Alright, let's get to it. So first things first, if you don't have UV tools, you can download it using the link down below. Or if you already have it, double check and make sure that you are using the newest version. If you aren't, you'll see this up top where it says new version available, and you can click on it and then go here and click yes. Alright, so now that you're up and running and all up to date, I'm going to show you how to use the exposure time finder to find the best exposure with any resin on your 3D printer. But real quick, let's talk about this list of compatible printers. So if you don't see your printer listed here, don't despair. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not supported. It might just mean that it hasn't been tested yet. And I'll show you how to, step-by-step, uh, step, I'll show you how to test this exposure finder to make sure that you don't waste any resin. All right, so we're back in UV tools. Basically, UV tools is kind of like the resin printing toolkit. It can do a lot of amazing things, and there's a lot of stuff that I'm excited about doing videos for in the future. But for right now, I'm going to focus on one aspect or, or one feature of UV tools in each video. And in this one, I'm going to be doing the exposure time finder. And in order to do that, what we're going to have to do is pull in a pre-sliced file from the printer that you want to use. And I recommend using the pre-sliced file that either came on the USB drive for your printer or one that you can get from the printer's manufacturer. So in my situation, I'm going to be using uh, the test file for the Epax E6 because I recently got that printer and it actually worked really well. So I recommend using that test file because it'll pull in all that useful information that's already been pre-sliced from the manufacturer. So let's go through that. You're going to go up to file, then go to open, and then use the file explorer to navigate to wherever you have that test stored. Now, in the description down below, I do have links to a couple of different manufacturers' pages where they give out those test files. So if you don't have one on hand, take a look down there and see if it's available. If not, you can reach out to your manufacturer, or you can just slice a simple file. I just like using the test files because I know that the settings are going to be a pretty good range to start with, and I can refine them from there, but I don't have to worry about doing a whole lot of fiddling right off the bat. So you're going to click on your test and hit open. Once the test loads in, you can see a preview here on the left, and you can see the layer view here on the right and you can scroll up to see how your test would be printed if you were printing this test, but we're not going to be doing that. We're actually going to go to Calibration and then go to Exposure Time Finder, and that'll open up a new window. Now, in this window, there's a ton of different options, and it can seem a little overwhelming at first, but there's only a few things we need to change, and I'm going to walk you through each one. Starting with a profile. So you can give this specific profile a name. That way you don't have to load in that test file every time you want to make a test for this specific printer. So I'm going to call this one Epax E6 medium range, and I'll explain the medium range thing in a little bit here. But remember, you don't want to click this plus symbol until you've put all the settings in that you want to use. Otherwise, whenever you load this profile in, it's going to load in with the settings you currently have, not the ones that you're about to put in. Next thing we're going to look at is layer height. I typically print at 0.05 because I feel like that gives me good results without taking a lot of time like some of the thinner layer heights do. But obviously you can do whatever you want, that's what this test is for. Next setting we're going to look at is bottom layers. In some situations, I might use five bottom layers if it's a really big model and I want to make sure it's going to hold because it's going to be a multiple hour print and I don't want to waste my time, but typically four layers should be enough for pretty much anything and especially for this test. And next up is bottom exposure. Now, just a quick heads up, all the settings that we're seeing here have been pulled from that test print that we loaded in earlier. And I would recommend using a test print that you have printed before so that you know that it works on your printer and you got good results because that's going to give you the best end result from this test here. So I'm going to leave the bottom exposure right where it is because this test printed just fine on my E6, but if for whatever reason you didn't have this setting or you wanted to try to tweak it a little bit, on a mono screen printer, typically 25 seconds should be fine on a uh, older generation RGB screen or a standard color screen. Uh, I would recommend doing something probably closer to the 40 to 50 range to start just to make sure that you get good adhesion. Next, we're going to move on to normal exposure. Now this one I will change because this is the one that tells UV tools where you want your test to start. So in other words, your test is going to start at 3 seconds and move up. And I don't want that, especially not on a mono screen printer that's a bit high. I would probably start my test, if I wanted to do more of a medium range like what I have listed here, I would probably start at 2.5 seconds and move up from there. And that's it for these settings here, so we're going to move down. Now this next option is really up to you, but I like using the positive pins and negative holes option, just because I feel like it gives you another point of data to read. And you can see that represented in the preview over here. Now, another really cool and optional setting is that you can come down here where it says text, and you can change this to whatever you want. 
So for example, you could use it to keep track of what resin you're testing or any other criteria you think is important to you. And then from here, we're gonna scroll down to what is arguably the most important part of this test, and that's multi-exposures. Click on enable for advanced users. And then from here is where we're actually going to tell UV tools how we want our test to be run. So normal step is basically where we determine how fine or how broad we want our test to be. In other words, you can say if you want it to be tested in increments of 0.25 seconds versus 0.5 seconds versus 0.75, and then you can define over here at maximum generations how many of those tests you want to do. So for example, if I wanted to do a medium range test, which is what we call this profile, on a mono screen printer, I would use increments of 0.5 seconds. And then I personally like having six different tests on each block, so I'm going to set this to five because it's going to generate five additional tests on top of the one that we specified at the very beginning. And I personally think that that's a really good way to start your testing. So you're gonna have six different tests that are all gonna be tested in 0.5 increments, and that'll give you a nice broad range to pull your data from. Now from here, we're just gonna hit generate exposure table. And then if you scroll down, you can see the entirety of your test. So it's gonna start at 2.5 and it's gonna end at five. And now from here, if you wanted to, you could add one additional test. So you come up here to layer height, you would specify that it's gonna be at 0.05. I would highly recommend keeping your bottom exposure the same. And then for normal exposure, we could try 2.25 and then just click add. And now you can see that your test starts at 2.25 instead of starting at 2.5. And you can see that we have seven entries instead of six. So if you wanted to go back to six, you could come down here and select this one and just remove it. Click yes, and then it's gone. And if you're happy with everything you're seeing here, then you can just go down to exposure time finder. It's gonna ask if you're sure that you wanna generate the test. And if you are, then click yes. So when that loads in, sometimes the test comes in zoomed in really far, so just use your mouse wheel to scroll back a little bit so you can see what's going on. And from here you can see a preview for the bottom layer of your test, which starts at 2.25 and ends at 4.5. And then same as before, we can use the layer view to scroll up to the very top to see how the test is going to be printed. And if everything looks good, then you're just going to go to File, and then you're going to go to Save As. And then from here, give your test a name that makes sense to you. So for example, I like to name my tests by the printer that they're for, the starting point and the ending point of the test, the increment in which the test is increased by, and how many tests there are, which is what you're seeing here. Now, one more quick tip. I do recommend using the file explorer over here to save directly onto the flash drive that you plan on using with your printer. And that's because it saves you a step, but also because transferring it from your computer onto the flash drive, there's always a slight chance of it getting corrupted on its way. So you kind of cut out the middleman and reduce your risk just slightly and keeps your file safer by just putting it right onto the flash drive to begin with. But then again, I'm overly cautious. But once you have everything where you want it, just click save. And that's it, you have your test saved and ready to go. So now let's talk about how to read it when it's done. So here are two different tests that I did on the E6. On the left is a bit more of a broad test. I started at 2.25, increasing in increments of 0.5. And then on the right is a test that's a lot more narrow. I started at 1.75, increasing in increments of 0.25. Now, a couple of points with this test, you wanna make sure that you clean it very well, but very gently. And you also wanna make sure that you're not curing it. So this test is read without being cured. That's really important. In the center is this test from the left over here, just blown up a little bit. And you can see that this test is really cool because the first one is just a little underexposed. This one is almost perfect. And then this test is a little overexposed. So the reason I said this test was a little underexposed, it's really hard to show in pictures and I apologize, but some of the edges of these letters and this smallest bar here was actually kind of getting pulled up a little bit, which means that they weren't curing long enough to withstand the suction force from the FEP. And that's a pretty good sign that the small and delicate parts of your model aren't gonna form correctly. Another issue is the missing pins here. So I really like using the positive pins and negative holes because I think it's a really good representation for your support points. And the reason that these missing pins bother me is because if you think about your supports trying to pull a model off the FEP as it's pulling against them, if those support points aren't really strong, it's not going to be able to overcome that force and pull those off. So what's going to happen is your model is going to break away and you'll have your supports printed almost perfectly, but with no model. So if you've ever had that happen, what's probably going on is that either your support points aren't strong enough because they haven't been exposed long enough, or the orientation of your model is just not in a good place so the your supports can't overcome that force but typically it's because your exposure time is a little too low so that's why it's always a good idea to have your uh your test and your um your eventual resin exposure a little higher 
because it will end up ensuring that your small details and that your supports are formed correctly. So that's why if I was choosing between these two, I would absolutely go with 2.75 over 2.25 because it's always good to be a little overexposed than underexposed. It's the difference between potentially losing a tiny little bit of detail that you're never going to notice versus having your model fail completely. And then if we drop down to 3.25, you'll see that we lose almost all definition in this line here. And that if we grabbed this corner of the bullseye in this corner and tried to pull the uh, negative parts and the positive parts together, they wouldn't fit. They're a little bit too fat. They're a little bit too overexposed. So this wouldn't really work. So that tells me that this is overexposed. So it's kind of cool that within the first three blocks here, we get a good range. So after I got the results from that test, I did one that was a little bit more precise. So I started really low, I started at 1.75, and that was clearly too low, and I moved in increments that were really fine because I wanted to see just how fine I could go with a mono screen. So right away you can see we're missing a bunch of pins, and we're missing the one off the 1.75. That tells me that small details would not be preserved with this exposure. Moving up two seconds looks a little bit better, but we're still missing some pins, and all in all it looked just a little flimsy in some of the smaller spots. Then we move up to 2.25 and you can see something a little weird. So even though it's the same exposure, this test looks different than this one. And there's a couple of different reasons for this and there's a lot of things you have to take into account with resin printers. So first and foremost, bed level is really important. It's very possible that my bed level was off just slightly, so I got better results here closer to the center than I did over here at the edge, even though they both have the same exposure. It's also important to remember that though these machines are capable of amazing detail, they are still hobby machines, so they're not gonna be laser accurate. So you can see here that I really had no difference between 2.25 and 2.5 on this test, so to be safe I tried printing a model at both these ranges. They both looked identical, there was no loss of detail and all the supports seemed to hold fine. So just to make sure that I could use the entire build plate without any concern, I did start printing at 2.5 and I've been getting awesome results. And this is why it's good to do multiple tests in different ranges, because the more information you have the better decision you can make about exposures. So last but not least, as promised, I'm going to show you how to test your printer to make sure that it's compatible with this function of UV tools so that you're not wasting any time or resin. First thing, make sure your bottom layers are set to one. Make sure that your bottom exposure is set to five seconds, and then you're gonna set your normal exposure to two seconds. Then scroll down to the multi exposure, enable it, and then you're going to go and set your normal step for two seconds, and you're just gonna do three tests. Then generate and save the test, but before you try it on your printer, take out the vat, take off the build plate, and put a piece of printer paper over top the LCD screen. So what you'll see if your printer is compatible is your one layer will come up and be exposed for 5 seconds, then your first test will come up and be exposed for 2 seconds, then the second test will come up and be exposed for 4 seconds, and then the third test will come up and be exposed for 6 seconds. So if your tests are not increasing in increments of two seconds, then you know that the test is not compatible with your printer. So I wanna take a minute to say thank you and give a massive shout out to Tiago for creating this amazing program and to Khalil and Venetia for helping me understand how to use it better and working with me so I could create this tutorial video. All right, as always, if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. It helps the channel grow and I really appreciate it. And if you like the work that I'm doing here and you want to help the channel grow, you can find my Patreon information down below. Alright, let's go print something.